carry these matters to a speedy termination, not only because it was the preparation day for the Passover, and no secular work should be done after noon, but also because they feared Pilate might any time return to the Roman capital of Judea, Caesarea, since he was in Jerusalem only for the Passover celebration. But Annas did not succeed in keeping control of the court. After Jesus had so unexpectedly answered Caiaphas, the high priest stepped forward and smote him in the face with his hand. Annas was truly shocked as the other members of the court, in passing out of the room, spit in Jesus' face, and many of them mockingly slapped him with the palms of their hands. And thus, in disorder and with such unheard-of confusion, this first session of the Sanhedrin's trial of Jesus ended at half-past four o'clock. Thirty prejudiced and tradition-blinded false judges, with their false witnesses, are presuming to sit in judgment on the righteous creator of a universe. And these impassioned accusers are exasperated by the majestic silence and superb bearing of this God-man. His silence is terrible to endure. His speech is fearlessly defiant. He is unmoved by their threats and undaunted by their assaults. Man sits in judgment on God, but even then he loves them and would save them if he could. 4. The Hour of Humiliation The Jewish law required that, in the matter of passing the death sentence, there should be two sessions of the court. This second session was to be held on the day following the first, and the intervening time was to be spent in fasting and mourning by the members of the court. But these men could not await the next day for the confirmation of their decision that Jesus must die. They waited only one hour. In the meantime, Jesus was left in the audience chamber in the custody of the temple guards, who, with the servants of the high priest, amused themselves by heaping every sort of indignity upon the Son of Man. They mocked him, spit upon him, and cruelly buffeted him. They would strike him in the face with a rod and say, Prophesy to us, you the Deliverer, who it was that struck you. And thus they went on for one full hour, reviling and mistreating this unresisting man of Galilee. During this tragic hour of suffering and mock trials before the ignorant and unfeeling guards and servants, John Zebedee waited in lonely terror in an adjoining room. When these abuses first started, Jesus indicated to John, by a nod of his head, that he should retire. The master well knew that, if he permitted his apostle to remain in the room to witness these indignities, John's resentment would be so aroused as to produce such an outbreak of protesting indignation as would probably result in his death. Throughout this awful hour, Jesus uttered no word. To this gentle and sensitive soul of humankind, joined in personality relationship with the God of all this universe, there was no more bitter portion of his cup of humiliation than this terrible hour at the mercy of these ignorant and cruel guards and servants, who had been stimulated to abuse him by the example of the members of this so-called Sanhedrist court. The human heart cannot possibly conceive of the shudder of indignation that swept out over a vast universe as the celestial intelligences witnessed this sight of their beloved sovereign submitting himself to the will of his ignorant and misguided creatures on the sin-darkened sphere of unfortunate Urantia. What is this trait of the animal in man which leads him to want to insult and physically assault that which he cannot spiritually attain or intellectually achieve? In the half-civilized man there still lurks an evil brutality which seeks to vent itself upon those who are superior in wisdom and spiritual attainment. Witness the evil coarseness and the brutal ferocity of these supposedly civilized men as they derived a certain form of animal pleasure from this physical attack upon the unresisting son of man. As these insults, taunts, and blows fell upon Jesus, he was undefending but not defenseless. Jesus was not vanquished, merely uncontending in the material sense. These are the moments of the Master's greatest victories in all his long and eventful career as Maker, Upholder, and Savior of a vast and far-flung universe. Having lived to the full a life of revealing God to man, Jesus is now engaged in making a new and unprecedented revelation of man to God. Jesus is now revealing to the worlds the final triumph over all fears of creature personality isolation. The Son of Man has finally achieved the realization of identity as the Son of God. 
Jesus does not hesitate to assert that he and the Father are one, and on the basis of the fact and truth of that supreme and supernal experience, he admonishes every kingdom believer to become one with him, even as he and his Father are one. The living experience in the religion of Jesus thus becomes the sure and certain technique whereby the spiritually isolated and cosmically lonely mortals of earth are enabled to escape personality isolation, with all its consequences of fear and dissociated feelings of helplessness. In the fraternal realities of the kingdom of heaven, the faith sons of God find final deliverance from the isolation of the self, both personal and planetary. The God-knowing believer increasingly experiences the ecstasy and grandeur of spiritual socialization on a universe scale. Citizenship on high in association with the eternal realization of the divine destiny of perfection attainment. 5. The Second Meeting of the Court At 5.30 o'clock the court reassembled, and Jesus was led into the adjoining room where John was waiting. Here the Roman soldier and the temple guards watched over Jesus while the court began the formulation of the charges which were to be presented to Pilate. Annas made it clear to his associates that the charge of blasphemy would carry no weight with Pilate. Judas was present during this second meeting of the court, but he gave no testimony. This session of the court lasted only a half hour, and when they adjourned to go before Pilate, they had drawn up the indictment of Jesus as being worthy of death under three heads. 1. That he was a perverter of the Jewish nation, he deceived the people and incited them to rebellion. 2. That he taught the people to refuse to pay tribute to Caesar. 3. That, by claiming to be a king and the founder of a new sort of kingdom, he incited treason against the emperor. This entire procedure was irregular and wholly contrary to the Jewish laws. No two witnesses had agreed on any matter, except those who testified regarding Jesus' statement about destroying the temple and raising it again in three days. And even concerning that point, no witness spoke for the defense, and neither was Jesus asked to explain his intended meaning. The only point the court could have consistently judged him on was that of blasphemy, and that would have rested entirely on his own testimony. Even concerning blasphemy, they failed to cast a formal ballot for the death sentence. And now they presumed to formulate three charges, with which to go before Pilate, on which no witnesses had been heard, and which were agreed upon while the accused prisoner was absent. When this was done, three of the Pharisees took their leave. They wanted to see Jesus destroyed, but they would not formulate charges against him without witnesses and in his absence. Jesus did not again appear before the Sanhedrist court. They did not want again to look upon his face as they sat in judgment upon his innocent life. Jesus did not know, as a man, of their formal charges until he heard them recited by Pilate. While Jesus was in the room with John and the guards, and while the court was in its second session, some of the women about the high priest's palace, together with their friends, came to look upon the strange prisoner, and one of them asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me, and if I ask you, you will not answer. At six o'clock that morning, Jesus was led forth from the home of Caiaphas to appear before Pilate for confirmation of the sentence of death which the Sanhedrist court had so unjustly and irregularly decreed.